hardships. And, and strange thing about hardships, it's, it's hard, but they are a pathway to peace. So Mike, lead us in that serenity prayer, will you? Yes. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Amen. So like we said, uh, the next part of the serenity prayer that we're going to be dealing with is how to activate um, this, this path of peace when we're in the midst of hardship. Accepting hardships as a pathway to peace, taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I'd have it, trusting that he will make all things right if, if I surrender to his will. Amen. Let's talk about that. Yeah, you know, um, every time I, for all, for all the years I've been going through this, there are certain things that jump out at me in this prayer that need to jump out at me because of that God is saying that. And, and the, the last one that has been jumping out at me actually is taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. But for a long time, it was accepting hardships as a pathway to peace. And I'm thinking, why? Why, why are you impressing this upon me right now? Well, the reality is, life ain't easy. And you can have joy in spite of the circumstances you find yourself in, but you have to accept that life is going to be full of hardships. If you don't accept it, you're going to be miserable. You have to accept it. Yeah, life contains unavoidable challenges. Nobody receives a get-out-of-suffering-free card. Nobody. You are going to be forced to deal with things in life that you don't want to deal with. That's right. And if you don't come to a place of acceptance, if you don't come to that realization, you're going to be miserable. Because what I described as stress is reality and expectations. And the further my expectations are from the reality, the greater the, the gap, and the greater the gap, the greater the stress. And if you expect life to be a bowl of cherries without the pits, you're going to be under a lot of stress because every time you bite into a cherry, there's going to be a pit. And it's, it's like, what? I wasn't expecting that. Well, we need to expect that. So, so if we can align our expectations with reality, hardship, then we can find some peace on that pathway. Because but, but when you bite down on that pit on your tooth... It hurts. Hardship can destroy your surrender to that. And when we talk about surrender, we're talking about an inner sense of peace that really empowers you to hope, that, that, that keeps you keeping on. In John 16, 33, it says, Jesus was teaching, he says, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. And this means that. Followers of Jesus are not going to be exempt from trouble, from the suffering that comes through nature and through other human beings and through our physical bodies when they start to fail and through all kinds of our own disastrous choices. Jesus has overcome all those things and he gives us the power to overcome those things. Amen. You know, when you think of God's promises, what do you think of? I just think that he's going to be with me. That's the biggest thing I can hold on to. And, and then the hope of that in, in the end. All things are set right. So nobody clings to the promise that in this world you will have trouble. That's a promise. Jesus said it. That's a promise. And I don't know why it is, but whenever I think of the promises of God, for some reason, that one pops up in my head first. Maybe it's because he's still trying to convince me. You know, my life's been pretty much a piece of cake. It really has. It, I, mean, I cannot tell you the number of stories I've heard from people about how traumatic and how how just hard and awful things were for them, and I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know what that's like. And even now, going through what we're going through with uh, with you know just for some reason, cancer has decided to hit our family. Even now, I just feel like, well, okay, we'll get through it. And maybe God is trying to impress upon me, Mike, you're not really. 
you're not really understanding this. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Sorry. I just oh no, it's 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 okay. Yeah. But we're like you said, I had smooth sailing, I had little bumps in here and there, and no little difficulties, and and now here, all of a sudden, your family is, well, you you too, you just went through it in, in the depths of, of physical challenges, and yeah, that is a hardship. It really is. Well, to maintain serenity, we've got to accept that life can be hard. In fact, we should expect that it will be hard and that when things are going easy and going well, we need to celebrate it. Because it ain't going to last. You're either heading into a storm, you're already in the middle of the storm, or you're just heading out of another one. So in between those storms, my goodness, if, if, if you think life will always go how you want it, you will inevitably spend a lot of time being disappointed. You know, that storm analogy is great. Because if you see a storm coming, I, I, anybody ever live in the Midwest? You know, and because and, and, we, we spent a fair number of years there, and you could see thunderstorms on the horizon, and they would be coming towards you. And as they come towards you, it's like, oh no, here it comes, here it comes. And it would get darker, and it would get windier, and then the rain would start to fall, and then you didn't know if there was going to be a tornado, and, and, and you would ride it out, and it could be really, really intense for, I don't know, for usually 20, 30 minutes, maybe, not even that long sometimes. But then when it passes over you, and the rain stops, and the clouds start to break up, it is one of the most beautiful things you will ever see. It is absolutely gorgeous to see the sun breaking through the clouds and to smell the fresh air with the rain, with the, the newly fallen rain. It is absolutely one of the most beautiful things you will ever see. And when we go through a storm, a lot of people try to avoid going through the storm. They try to run away from it, and it just follows them. But if you allow yourself to go through it, what do you come to on the other side? You come to beauty. You come to grace. You come, you come to something that is indescribably lovely. So we can't be afraid to do this. When Ian hit uh, Hurricane Ian hit the Florida coast, uh, you know, you might wonder, well, what did those people do that that they deserve that? And guess what? They didn't do anything to deserve that. Life is often unfair and unjust. And that's just the way it is in a broken world. Suck it up, buttercup. That's the way it is. So allowing hardship to plant us on the path of peace first involves accepting those sources of suffering that we did not choose, we didn't originally choose, but since it's there in our lives, being already ours, what we are invited to do is to accept it. Accept means embracing the thing that we instinctively want to eliminate. It is so counter-cultural. It is so counter-instinctual. 180 degrees opposite of what we want to naturally do. Because just like Mike said, we want to either fight it or we want to ignore it. But Jesus tells us something different. Something quite different. <coughs> Luke 14.27 And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And the cross can represent in your life any form of suffering or sacrifice. Carrying your cross means that you are dealing with the hardship. Yeah, do you guys remember the Beatitudes? The, the eight, the, I think the eight blessed bees, I think there's eight of them, yeah, that Jesus began his Sermon on the Mount with. Those are kind of like foundational to our faith. It, it's, it, they're kind of like, I mean, they're almost akin to the Ten Commandments. Well, one of those eight foundations is blessed are those who mourn. Why do we mourn? Because we grieve. Because we, we grieve because we've experienced loss. Loss is hardship. That's right. there, there we go again. Jesus is telling us very, very clearly, you're going to have problems in life. Yeah. And you're going to have to learn how to grieve and mourn those problems. Because when you go through a grief or a mourning the way I've prescribed for you, you come to that place of acceptance where you can still find joy in the midst of the suffering. 
It's, it's imperative that we learn how to do this. See, taking up your cross is not really, in the final analysis, choosing between whether you're going to suffer or not. That choice is not yours. You will suffer. But we can choose to acknowledge the suffering rather than ignore it, rather than fighting it. And while holding on to it, we can choose to look toward God. In yeah. fact, taking up our cross is to allow suffering to become a place of meeting with God. So if that's true, and I believe that it is, then denying it, stuffing it, ignoring it, prevents us from that meeting with God. That's right. And it doesn't die within us. It festers and it grows and it comes out as so many different things. Ultimately, it comes out as anger, and that anger is spilled onto the people around us, and we can't really enjoy the, the fruit of our relationship with God when we allow anger to be our boss, when we allow denial to be our boss. So it's really, really important. This is such an important point. It's like you said, like with, with uh, stress. You feel stressed, what, do you feel happy-go-lucky? You want to cut jokes? No, you're angry! That's... <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've gotten in trouble at home because I've been working on something, concentrating, it's not going well, and then somebody asked me to do something for them. She is here now, by the way. I know she is. <laughs> she knows exactly. So this is confession time. And so I apologize to my wife often, often, and I'm trying to just not, I'm trying to take the hardship that caused the stress and put it on a path of peace. And it is difficult. Sorrow and suffering can make some people quarrelsome and bitter, but it can also sweeten and refine. It's the same event with opposite effects. See, what happens to us from without doesn't determine the consequences of what, what, what matters. It is not what happens to you, but what you do with it after it does happen to you. So what happens to you, not as important as what happens in you. Yeah, we, uh, my wife and I were having a conversation this week uh, about this subject and about what do we do, how do we handle seemingly impossible circumstances? How do we handle those situations? And, and the point that you're making is like, that... Like, like building a home in Idaho? <laughs> oh, you mean, you mean having plans to, but oh, yeah. waiting for it to start? For how many years now? Hey, what can you do? Yeah, see, that's a hardship. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. That's right. But the, the point is, is that it doesn't matter what our circumstances are. If our mindset is right, if we choose an attitude that will benefit us, it explains why Paul could be imprisoned and be singing praises and hymns to God while, while in chains. I don't know that I could do that. Oh God, thank you for my chains in prison. Thank you for my bunkmate. Thank you for my loss of freedom. He could do that because his mindset and his attitude were fixed on God and not on his circumstances. So two people in the same situation can have different reactions. Consider Golgotha, where they crucified not only Jesus, but two others. One complained and railed against Jesus for not saving them. Not saving himself, not saving them. The other accepted the tragedy of what was happening as the result of his sins. He repents, and through that repentance saw an open door and an invitation to paradise. And then, of course, Jesus on the cross, he, he redeems humanity. So, we, when you accept hardship, you can deal with the hardship and then make the right choices as you carry the cross. Amen. You can do it. Yeah, I know you can. And when we carry the cross, we are, we are showing what God can do in our lives and we are testifying to other people that if God can do this for me, God can do this to you, for you. And, and for us to pretend or to suggest, and this is a series I think I want us to, to think about in the future, to, for us to pretend that when you become a Christian, everything becomes a bed of roses is, is such a lie. 
People need to see how we handle the difficult things. That what, what sets us apart as Christians isn't what happens to us in life. It's what happens to us in our heart and how God transforms our, our thinking and how we have the hope of eternity with Him and how that allows us to get through life, as the end of the prayer says, reasonably happy yeah. so that we can eventually be supremely happy. Yeah. So I, I, I think if we're not supposed to escape suffering or just merely accept suffering, <coughs> we are supposed to use or suffering. Like I said before, you can't determine what happens to you, but you can determine what it shall do to you after it happens. So you can use hardship to grow internally, to build up your character, refining your attitudes, your perceptions of events. And these are changes that are necessary for you to walk the path of peace. James chapter 1, verses uh, 2 through 5, says, Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides, you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced out into the open, shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. If you don't know what you're doing, ever been there? Pray to the Father, because He loves to help. And that's the Word. This was the subject of our devotional yesterday morning when I met with uh, my men's group at the pier. About how God uses our suffering and our hardships as a way to grow us. And I admitted to the guys that scripture that we just read from James. I ain't there yet. I, I wish that I was. But I'm, being, I'm not there yet. I still have a really difficult time going, oh boy, look at this bad thing that just happened to us. God is doing something great in my life. I just, I'm not there yet. Um, you know, I think I might know one person in my life that I could honestly say, I think this person uh, yeah, identifies uh, that. Me too, and they're in this auditorium. Yeah, and I, and, 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 and I am so thankful for that me. person. Yeah, it ain't me. It ain't me. But... But we were talking, and because and, and, the guys that I meet with, they've all been through some pretty difficult trials in their life. And one of the guys that, that we meet with that I just, I love to death, this guy is such a great guy. And he's going through some really, really gnarly stuff right now. And some of it was of his own making, and it was because he made some bad choices in his life. But when he finally came to grips with it and he did the right thing, there were still consequences that he, that he had to face up to. And we were talking about this, how God uses our suffering to grow us and to help us love other people and to be an example and inspire other people. Because I think that when we allow our hardships to be a part of our story, be a part of our life, then we have a redeeming story that we can share with people. This is where I was. This is what God did for me. And I am so grateful for that. And my buddy yesterday said, well, I'm kind of tired of God using me to inspire other people through my hardships right now. And I, and I said, I, said I, I get it. I totally get it. But if nothing else, I said, you need to know that I, you have inspired so many people, but I can only speak for myself. I, you blow me away. Your perseverance in the face of what you're dealing with just is so inspiring to me. So God takes these things... You know, we know that all things work together for good who, 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 for those who love God. God takes these things if we allow Him to, and He makes it part of a redemptive story that allows us to share the real gospel with people. Because God, if God can redeem me, God can redeem you. It's so important to understand this, you guys. Right. Yeah. Now, considering hardship, pain, and suffering is a gift, actually consider that is a miraculous change in perception perception and attitude right there. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. But you can transform hardship from a stumbling block into a stepping stone. And one of those verses of Scripture that gives me a lot of comfort is Romans 5, uh, verses 3 through 5. It says, there's more to come. Amen! We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate 
patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue within, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we are never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary, we can round up enough containers to hold, we can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit, even when we are suffering. Amen. Which brings us then to trust. Mm. And the next part of the prayer. Yeah. Trusting that He will make all things right. Well, one of the next parts. Trusting that He will make all things right if I surrender to His will. This whole transformation of being able to carry your cross and seeing it from a heavenly perspective is only possible when you trust God. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure everything out on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Yeah. So trust begins, first of, all, first of all, with a decision to trust. You decide. Yes. You have to choose that. And if somebody in your life gives you a reason not to trust them, then at some point, if you're going to have a healed relationship, you're going to have to choose to trust them again. Mm. Not blindly. You know, when I break somebody's trust, I have to demonstrate to them that I am trustworthy. But ultimately, in healthy relationships, we have to learn how to trust one another. And that starts first and foremost with God. He's not going to let us down. Right. And, and, and friends, it, trust is built, even with the Lord, in incremental steps. You see, it's through your continued experience of God's provision and His help in times of trouble that, that you begin to rely on Him. Trust is built, my friends, as you practice the seven habits of a disciple. When you're in the Word, reading the Word, when you're praying and when you're in fellowship with like-minded believers, when you use your gifts in service, when you worship Him, giving God His due, when you are obedient, even the smallest of obedience, and, and when, when there's problems come up and, and, and you meditate and contemplate and you have this deep heart with talk with God, these things as He comes through, builds your trust. So those seven habits of a disciple that I constantly are telling people they got to use, these are your invitations to God to come and meet with you. And He will. He does. Incremental steps. And He never breaks trust. No. And part of our problem is, is that the people in our life, we all break one another's trust from time to time. We can spend, we can spend a year building up a block wall of trust, and we only have to take two or three blocks off of that wall, and it just shatters the whole wall, because we take them off from the foundation. And so then we have to start that over again. But when I think about what God has been in my life, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think this is healthy for me to think this. I don't think I'm just being naive. I think you know what? Everything that I have ever been through in my life, God has brought me through. No matter how easy or difficult, God has brought me through. And every person in this room can say exactly the same thing. Because for as many bad days as you've had, as many trials as you've gone through, as many losses as you've, as you've experienced, the fact that you're sitting here right now is testimony to the fact that God has brought you through that. Thank you. And there's more to come, including the hardships. But if at my age, 66, God has brought me through, why would God bring me through for, for the first 66 years of my life and then just decide one day, yeah. no, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> that would be insane for me to think that. That's right. Yeah. When uh, I had tragedy visit my life, I thought God broke trust with me. And um, I had to rethink uh, so many things that I had come to believe. Um, like, uh, was it Jeremiah 20? I know the plans I have for you. Have you the plans to prosper you? you know, I'm thinking, Lord, that was my promise, and, and you just broke it. But in my rethinking, I, God's so gracious. He holds on to you even when you're squirming to let go. I realize that that's not an individual promise to people. 
It was a promise to a nation of godly people. This is my plan for you. I want to be part of that group. Trusting means it's hard. Trusting means that you believe that God will provide you with everything you need to get through whatever you are facing. That is what God will do. That's what God has done. What we just said. That's what God has done. And His character is trustworthy. He's going to keep doing it. And I do think that, that Jeremiah scripture is for a nation, but I do think it's for me too. Because I think when God looks at us, He looks at us with the big picture. And we forget that this is just the first step. There's more to come. And in the big picture, well, yeah, I can't think about how, how much more prosperous am I going to be to live in God's presence, to actually live in His presence, where I can talk to Him. And you know, That's what awaits. And so I do believe that it's for us in that sense. But I think many people do misinterpret that scripture and think, oh, well, that, American that, dream. That, nothing bad's going to happen. No, American dream. No, Everything that happens will be okay. It'll be great for me. It's not. Hardship. Hardship? Yes, it is a path to peace when you accept the difficult situation and actively work to remedy the situation. Trust God to supply what you need to effectively deal with the situation and believe that God can use that situation and can squeeze some good out of it if you follow him through the valley. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to be afraid because you are with me. That's another scripture that I come back to so many times because we all, on multiple occasions, walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And even when we don't know that God is with us, He promises that He is. And I need to remember that. And one of my phrases with people in counseling is, know what you know. Don't focus on what you don't know. Focus on what you do know. And the scripture very, very clearly says, I'm with you always, even until the end of the earth. God's with us. Whether we know it or not, God is with us. Know what you know. 